Shags and welcome to episode 9 of All Arts Quite Useless. It might be the third time round the block today and my pick again, but we have a first in our special guest today. Anthony Dragonetti has written with us at CAVMAG and is an honorary friend of the pod and is here with us today to talk all things Brazil. The, the film, not the country. Terry Gilliam's 1985 film is available on Amazon Prime at the moment and follows the bureaucratic nightmare that Sam Lowry finds himself in trying to find the literal woman of his dreams. Olivia couldn't be with us today for this episode, all explained in the pod, but Anthony slips into the role nicely, and frankly, all too professionally. Back at the end, enjoy. Olivia, you look very different today. You've grown a big beard, and you're on tropical, tropical island. Yeah, though, bearded, so. tropical, American. Um, it's a total <laughs> rebrand for the show. <laughs> a lot of people have picked up new skills in lockdown, but I don't think many people have picked up entire new personalities or personas. We're taking it to strange new places. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> we yeah we've uh, we've got our first guest in Anthony. Yes, hello, good to be here. Yeah, yeah, Anthony Dragonetti. Uh, you may know him as the guy from Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> I'm known as the guy from Twitter. But, uh, yeah, he's um he's he's uh he's been a big supporter of Cavity Magazine, and um he's uh written for us as well. So and he's a pretty chill dude. So we just thought we'd have him on to discuss. Uh, Louis' pick for this week. Uh, yeah, what a pick. Uh, before we get to that, yeah, Liv couldn't be here today, unfortunately. She just totally forgot to watch <laughs> the film. I don't know, I don't know, quite know what happened there. She seemed a bit concerned that her brain was deteriorating and she just totally forgot and blanked it from her mind. So, best wishes to her. Mm. I hope she gets her brain checked sometime soon. But we've got Anthony on board, you know, new Liv. Everyone, you know, Push Anthony for SummerSlam. That's right. And uh, hopefully he'll be our new fi- he'll be our new fixture. But today we watched uh, Brazil. I picked it, didn't I? Yeah, you bloody did. I picked Brazil because I'd seen it once before, a few years ago now, uh, when Mark Kavod brought a thirty five mil print of it down to Truro in Cornwall at the cinema. There, I'd never seen it before then, and it was. Uh, it was weird. I was really looking forward to seeing it, and I was kind of impressed by it, but I didn't like it very much. And I think that had a lot to do with me having recently read 1984 at the time and not being told that it's pretty much the plot of 1984, or even just a straight-up retelling of 1984. So I kind of came away with a bit of taste in my mouth. But as the years have gone by, I've thought about it an awful lot, and I really, really like Terry Gilliam. And always meant to come back to it. Start a lockdown, I watched 12 Monkeys and thought that was amazing. And I made me think, right, it's time to watch Brazil again, I suppose. So, um, who's seen it before? Um, I'd seen one half of it, but I, <laughs> I quit halfway through because it was a bit too much for the, for the, for the setting that I was in. So, yeah, one half. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I last saw it. <laughs> I I rewatched it the other night for this, but I think I saw it before that, like maybe fifteen years ago. Oh wow! Wow! That's so quite nice. quite a long gap then between yeah. the last few. Yeah, I uh, I wow. kind of bounced off it the first time. I mean, I, I finished it, but I didn't love it, um, and I kind of left this time understanding it a bit more, but also still not loving it. 
<laughs> well, all right then. We'll go, we'll, Anthony, we'll go to you, we'll go to you first. What what were your initial thoughts? Um, you know, I think it's rightfully remembered as being like this visual feast. It's a, I mean, it's a gorgeous movie. Uh, the set designs are phenomenal. Um, as as a visual piece, I love it. Um, I think it's great, especially because it comes from that time where you have to do the whole thing with miniatures. So it just still looks very cool. Uh, there's no like real CGI or anything. So you know, it's really a feat of production. Um, but I think, you know, my, my issue with it really is kind of it as a movie, um, and, and more like the narrative and the story and the tone it strikes, uh, you know, it is 1984 and I think it's kind of hard to, to deal with, with that kind of like totalitarian kind of like bureaucracy storyline in 2020, you know, even though it was from, I think 85, um, watching it now, you know, you just feel like you've seen that motif like 8,000 times uh and you know just tonally it's weird like it is a depressing movie but at the same time there's still a lot like to me anyway there's a lot of very obvious monty python humor in it and it's it yes I'm yeah and it's just that. like i i felt uh it just didn't know what tone it wanted to strike you know for its two and a half hour running time so you know bouncing between like the the kind of like the very uh straight faced like monty python humor and then you know, all these action sequences and then, you know, the very kind of depressing way it ends. It just feels like it's it's all over the place as a story. Interesting. Uh, Jamie, we'll go to you next. Yeah. Um, so I'd actually, I hadn't seen this before. This was my first time viewing it. I'd never seen actually any um, Terry Gilliam films before. So it was kind of a, a first on that front as well. Um, and actually, I think from what it sounds like, my first impression of it is the most positive. I really, really loved it on first watch. I don't know whether it's the best film I've seen in a long time, but it's certainly the most I've enjoyed sitting down watching. For those who are familiar with the podcast, Jamie has loved every single thing we've talked about thus far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is also true. I don't know what it's going to take to make him. Yeah, you're going to have to show me something really drastic. That mind camp <laughs> or something. <laughs> but I, I uh, continue. Sorry, Jamie, I think carry I on. might go out on a limb and say this is the favourite thing that we've discussed so far. For for me, Ooh. yeah, I found the way that it kind of balanced some of the bleak stuff that it was drawing from 1984 while still having the python humor was quite a feat to be able to pull off to have those two things balanced because it, it is at once this kind of dark grim tale about a dystopian future but also it's in the same way that python is very very funny and very very witty in a way that kind of pokes fun at those things um so i loved it for that it is also incredible looking and I, I didn't realize until the end when it came up in the credits that it's pretty much all shot in that studio isn't it i don't think there's much if any location shooting from what i understand mm. i would i wouldn't have thought so there's not really yeah. that many like natural looking exteriors except for a few um, yeah it was a very cultivated world probably gonna need it? citation needed on that but from what i can tell you could probably safely bet that ninety percent of it was filmed in studio. Yeah, I would say. there was only one bit that was fully outdoors, and even that looked like stock footage of the very last oh, scene. Yeah. Basically, mm-hmm. he's imagining what it looks like. Yeah. His like dream bit. Him yeah. getting away. Yeah, it looked like um, like the beginning of Country File. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Should I give my thoughts then? Yeah, go on. Uh, go on. Well, yeah, I. I'm kind of, I'm a little bit torn because I agree with both Anthony's and Jamie's points uh, in the sense that it is a little bit um, dated with the uh, sort of reinterpretation of 1984 and like dystopian sci-fi can't really, it needs to try really hard to get away from that kind of um, oppressive bureaucratic uh, situation, um, but it's it's funny that everyone's kind of brought up 1984 because I didn't really think of 1984 that much when I watched it. I thought more of Brave New World and the trial. There's the obvious 1984 stuff with like the militarized police and the absolutist uh, judiciary system that they have and stuff. But uh, for one, the bureaucracy reminded me a lot more of the trial, but where it's uh, everyone sort of gets snowed under uh, and everyone gets snowed under their uh, processes and no one can really do anything without signing a million petitions. And obviously Robert De Niro's character is like the antithesis of that. And 
there's that there's that whole subplot um i think my major issue is it it's not a it's a really well written film in like in terms of humor and um world building but it's a really poorly narratively written film i think um because it's it's got this boilerplate uh plot and there's very little motivation i felt we'll get we can get into it more later but my 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 biggest turn off was the point where he um where sam lowry he uh decides to go like full uh rebel mode without really much motivation he just jumps in the cab of the um of i can't remember the character's name but i think it was jill yeah of jill and all of a sudden he's like i'm i'm a rebel now and it's and it's a bit bizarre. It doesn't see. I felt like there needed to be a bit more impetus for him to completely rescind his entire brainwashing, his entire programming, and his entire life. Because he's not like he's not oppressed. He is oppressed. Obviously, everyone's oppressed in this society, but he's not like hard done by. He's got a quite a comfortable position in society, and he just decides to throw it all off because he there's this woman has a familiar face to him, and so I and I, it felt a bit. Oh, you see, I disagree there. I disagree because I feel. I think the film does a very good point of showing that she is literally the only thing he cares about at all in his entire life. And I think that's that's why the dream sequences are so good, or because they're so fantastical, I think they help get across the idea that he really is enamored with her. The thing is, I don't wanna get I don't wanna give out that I didn't like the film because I really did actually yeah. I really did like the film. Uh, I thought it was quite charming and it's got that lovely, wonderful quaintness of uh Monty Python slapstick and and wordplay and stuff which is just like brilliant but it's yeah it's it's weird um i i know why i know why the studio didn't want to release it <laughs> put it that way um but yeah, yeah that's my they're my initial thoughts so uh over to you i guess louis i pretty much agree with what everyone said <laughs> i don't think any i don't think i could disagree with anything anyone said really so far I think the plot is the weakest point of this film. Uh, I think as individual scenes, it is fantastic. As you guys would have said, the set design is incredible. And the, I think the humour goes a long way to making this 1984 plot stretch further and make it different. I, th- I think the humour lends itself really well to it and uh, made it really, really good fun. So that even in a two and a half hour film that, with a plot that I'm not even that into, it's still a fun watch, which I think you can't say about too many films that you're not really interested in the story. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it more this time than my last time. I think because I knew where it was all going to go, it made me sort of relax and take in the ride a lot more. I was completely shocked to see Ian Holm in this. He, he passed away yeah, in the past week. R.I.P. But then... When he showed up on screen, it's like, oh, it's Bilbo! Yeah, that, that was a surprise <laughs> I completely treat. forgot he was in it. It's like, oh, yeah. He's really wonderful in this film yeah, as well. I, and he was really Fantastic. good. I yeah. thought he was really good in I wanted to see more. Of, I want to see way more of him. Mm. Yeah. It was, it was such a yeah, shame. Yeah, he, he sort of falls out of it in the, in the second kind half of the film. Kind of steals the scenes. But, uh, steals every scene he's in. He does. The scenes of him and Jonathan Price are really... And Jonathan Price, I think, is like perfectly mm. cast. Yeah. He's so good as this bumbling fool... And his physical comedy is really good in it. Yeah, the yeah. scene when he goes into the next door's office to try and use their computer, and he just keeps leaning over the guy, and they're like practically on top of each other, <laughs> hugging, and they just continue the scene as if nothing's happening. Yeah, I thought it was really, so really British. funny. Um, yeah, I, 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 I really did enjoy it this time. I, I think Twelve Monkeys probably has a better plot, but uh, just the world of this is so good looking and. Uh, once again, it says I can't believe he got the money to make this film. I can see why the studio wanted to stop him from putting it out there because they probably thought this is really weird. But, but yeah, I'm glad he made it's, it. It's a film. <laughs> it's a film that I'm glad exists. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Hi there. 
I want to talk to you about ducks. One of the things I wanted to bring up was Robert De Niro. Yes, just yes. <laughs> Please, can we? <laughs> <laughs> this is a, I remember thinking this last time, because if you look at all the accreditation, his name is all over this film, and he did a lot of press stuff, at this film, and he doesn't really do press mm-hmm. stuff. Mm. Or at least he didn't do it then, typically. And uh, he's in three scenes. <laughs> and it's a two and a half hour long film, and two of them are just him doing Boiler Man stuff, which I think is brilliant. He really is like the uh, the anti Ian home of this movie because while <laughs> while one actor steals every scene he's in, the other actor could have been played by anybody. I mean, I I I have seriously. No, like, really so I think I, I was looking before we started about uh, box office versus budget, and the budget was like fourteen million something American dollars. And then the box office brought in like eight, so to even like break even. And I have to imagine uh-huh. like several million of that went to Robert De Niro for five minutes of screen time. <laughs> <laughs> like it doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't even act. He doesn't even like do anything that re- requires Robert De Niro. Yeah, you can barely see his face. You don't even need. He doesn't need to yeah. like a moat or anything. His eyes really. Um, he does this weird like 1930s radio serial um, persona. Like it, it's very strange. Um, I I, I kind of wish that they had cast someone else. Really, when you're watching it, it's like you're very you're very clearly Robert De Niro. Yeah, he's the only person that is ever so slightly distracting because a lot, of, pretty much everyone else in the film is right. a British mm-hmm. actor, and not even huge British actors. I mean, Michael Palin's probably the biggest star in it, and not not even particularly for acting. But he he him in that role, he kind of slips into the world a lot easier. Yeah, I think. Than Robert De Niro as a boiler man. The chap who uh, plays in information retrieval, the guy who everyone's talking to, and he's like, uh, "Yes to them, no yes, to them." No that, that awesome scene. Um, I imagine he was like, "I." He must have been in, on like Coronation Street or one of the soaps at the time, because I ha- I had no idea what wh- where he was from. His face was completely unfamiliar to me. Um, yeah. And that goes for a lot for a lot of the actors. They all kind of look the same, really, I think, mm. which I think is probably intentional. But which is, yeah, uh, everyone's costumes are so but, similar. Yeah, so, uh, one of yeah the funniest I was say, they, they address it directly. When, uh, Michael Palin hands him the suit, and he says, "You'll never get anywhere in that suit." Here, try this one. A slightly it's lighter more, shade of grey. Yeah. yeah, with with a even with another grey pinstripe in it. And it's, yeah, <laughs> I laughed out loud at that point. I laughed out loud quite a lot during this film. Which I don't think I did the first time I saw it. The bit that got the biggest laugh out of me was when he's at, I think it's his mother's party, and the helpman wheels over to him and says, Sam, I need your help. And yeah. it hard cuts to him helping him go to the toilet oh, in yeah. the mirror. I forgot about but the visual gag's so great, because at first you're like, oh, okay, there's some buggery going on. Um, <laughs> but then you're like, oh, no, wait, he's just helping him like out of his wheelchair and then it's like and then you see the toilet bowl and it's like oh okay he's helping him have a piss and he's like shaking it <laughs> so he can shake shake the piss from his <laughs> it's yeah it's it's brilliant and, and and sam's even bad at that he just you can just tell that he's uncomfortable doing yeah. everything in this film he, he's so wonderful mm. it reminded me a lot of like um the price in that like role. an arthur dent kind of thing from in the you know just a very reserved british kind of guy who gets swept into stuff which is why I think, like, the yeah. stuff Jack, that you were saying about later on when he seems to just switch allegiance, I'm not sure whether he ever does. I think he just goes along with everything that happens just through this innate sense kind of makes him a, that kind of, kind of makes him a little bit of a boring protagonist, mm-hmm. though, to some degree, because mm-hmm. if he just goes goes along with the, with the events of the film. But um, just to bring it back to Robert De Niro, um, you, Anthony, you said that the budget potentially went to like hire, hiring him, and that it may it may well well have done. Um, I watched an interview with Terry Gilliam, and uh, he apparently Robert De Niro was like a huge Python fan, and was um, he was really enthusiastic to get involved with uh, Terry Gilliam, and um, apparently he'd like stay up till like four in the morning, dressed up. As a uh, uh, Harry Turtle, like in full in full heat up costume, just like rehearsing his lines because he was so nervous because <laughs> he wanted to do such a good job for uh, Terry Gilliam because he's a Python fan. <laughs> so. He was supposed to be um, Michael Palin's role. Oh, really? Well, that's the role he wanted, rather. Mm. That's the role he wanted, but he'd already uh, Gilliam had already given it to Palin, who's much more effective in that so role. They gave him Tuttle instead. Yeah, 
Yeah, yes, absolutely. Way, yeah. It would have been weirder if Jonathan Price was confiding in <laughs> Robert, Robert De Niro in the same yeah. way that he was. He was trying to confide in. I, I think it. I think it also works better um, thematically with the American actors being the sources of rebellion and um, and excitement, as opposed to the British sort of conformity, status quo. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, we're breaking the status quo by having an American on our podcast, right. you know, to, yeah. to, 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 to symbolize. <laughs> You're our Robert uh, De Niro. I, I the rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you threw our tea into the sea uh, and, 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 now you, and now you steal roles in our films. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, that tidbit about De Niro, uh, like method acting for Tuttle just seems sounds like the biggest waste of time. <laughs> I know, I know. That's what I thought when I heard it. I was like, "Why?" <laughs> Makes no sense. I wonder if his scenes got cut or something. Like, I, I don't know. It just he, he mm. like if you add up all his screen time, I doubt it even goes double digits. Which is so weird that he's second billing. I get he's second billing because he's a big name, but I just well just put a put an and Robert De Niro. I'll like, re- surely Louis, I'll remind you. Why did we buy Death by Temptation from that from that? We DVD bought shop? Death by Temp Yeah, we bought Death by Temptation because Sam Jackson's name was the first name on it. <laughs> He's in one scene. At the beginning. Yeah, alright. <laughs> to trick people. Have you seen and it works. Have you seen Death by Temptation? I haven't no. Oh well that's a must watch. That is a must watch. It's the second it's time we, the second time we brought it up on the podcast. It's the most bizarre film. Yeah. Twice in three weeks. Yeah. Have <laughs> to be the subject. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> next week is Death by Temptation. <laughs> I'm a martial artist, primarily by profession. I'm, uh, oh, I'm running late. I have to get to the airport. I have a flight for uh, Tibet, Tibet tonight. And I'm going to work on this new film project with Bruce Lee. Um, between me and you, mm-hmm. Bruce is not dead, okay? Yeah, I, I, I hadn't picked up on just how Python-esque it was. Uh, until this time, mm. uh, so many of the imagery I thought could have been in um, their sketch films or uh, the Flying Circus, like particularly like there's that scene when he's walking, it's like the incinerator place, and he sees all the men in hazmat suits playing volleyball. Right. Like, that was great. Close quarters that was over a tiny hilarious. net. That was so funny. Almost like Python esque that scene where um, they're in the restaurant with his mother. And they're friends, and there's an explosion, mm-hmm. and like mm, yeah. you know, there's like <laughs> dead mangled bodies behind them, but they're still eating and like having this conversation and everything. Like you know, like, even that like feels like like very dark Python. It's not yeah, my yeah. department. The, wait- the waiters bring right. the screen, don't they? Yeah, they put the device. The yeah, yeah. But even the the waiter as well, he felt like a Basil Fawlty esque character um, when he's just like, yeah. he's so he's so like arsy about. Um, Sam's like indecision. He doesn't. He doesn't want to eat anything. He's like, you must pick one. You must pick one. <laughs> what, one of the things I picked up on as well is I, I really enjoyed the dream sequences a lot this time round. I thought they were so visually great, and it reminded me a little bit of some of the things that Birdman did when he was trying to regress into like his mind. He would become this sort of superhero character who could well literally mm. fly. Well, I mean. I feel yeah. like Brazil even like, almost is like a superhero movie, but it's like it's power fantasy. It's the power <laughs> fantasy side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. I mean, that's the whole the whole conceit, right? Is that he lives this very uh, drab, meaningless life, but he he lives for his dreams. And then, of course, the way he yeah. ends up, he lives mm-hmm. forever in his dreams. Uh, yeah, you know. But I, I think that like the whole like sword fighting the samurai bit, you know, as like this like archangel is just like is pure superhero power fantasy. Yeah, I love it. <clears throat> I thought it. I thought it looked great. I didn't really know why he was a big samurai though. It, <laughs> that threw me. That threw me off of it. To be honest, I was, I was like, "Does that, I don't know. It doesn't really fit thematically. Do you know what I mean? It's like you have these, like the symbol of being an archangel, like almost like a like he's in Saint Michael armor, right. um, and he should be like I don't know. He should be fighting his serpent or something. Do you know what I mean? What was actually probably more effective than the samurai was when uh, Kurtzman's character breaks through the bricks and he's got these oh, brick yeah. arms and yes. brick face. And he's like trying to grasp hold of um, 
Sad. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. that was quite. I, I thought that looked great. It was quite haunting, and uh, and I, I, I was like, I was torn because it's like, all right, on the one hand, this guy is trying to drag him down, but on the other hand, he doesn't want him to leave him, and he is below. He's like down below in the gutters of this uh, barely necessary um, bureaucratic department, mm. and he's so like set on keeping him in his department that yeah he and he's like he's desperate for for him and yeah it was great that was i think that that was they had quite a sweet relationship actually those two i thought it was one of the few sort of like actually nice warm moments yeah, yeah. um there's almost because i got i got hints that it was slightly homoerotic you know because he really yeah ian Holm. I mean, it, it felt like he was really like he, he was intensely in love with um, Jonathan Price's character. It really felt like that was that like chemistry, but it felt like really, really uh, unrequited. You know what I mean? I didn't really get. That. I got more of um, see. I, I it, it is genuinely sweet the relationship. But I also like felt that Ian e. Holmes' character was almost manipulative. Um, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and he gets and him. He gets him to sure. sign the check. Yeah, exactly. The scene where he makes him sign the check because he he broke his hand. He's like, "Oh, I can't do it. I broke my hand." <laughs> like, yeah. come on. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, it's, oh, what a pathetic thing. Yeah, I am. exactly. Oh, what was me? I can't do it. You have to sign the check. Like, he just mm. like he needs he needs Jonathan Price's character. Like, he needs him because he's a he's a failure himself at his job. That was part of what I loved about the humor in this film was this kind of shots that it takes it internal business management and particularly like middle management is really scathing against that in this film and it's done in such a wonderful way like all the jokes about um i think it was when he comes into the building and um he's he like addresses the guy as saying oh i need to get clearance by this but i can't because it's classified and the um other character going back and forth to get the um the form that eventually signed all that kind of humor i think it's possibly like what makes it different with the comparisons with 1984 because whereas that's like dealing with the bigger things of a totalitarian state that's kind of like you know the little um micro office or internal business things yeah Yeah. the 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 minuscule yeah like the minutiae workings of the of a huge machine Mm -hmm. uh and the the smallest um like unsigned paper like you don't you didn't sign on the right dotted line so this is all invalid that's what reminded me of the trial because in the trial, it's um, it's all about uh, Joseph K. His character is he's trying to uh, clear his name for a crime that he's not been told he can. Com- he's not been told what crime he committed, only that he's being charged with a crime, and he has to go through all of these different layers of of the legal system, and it all like winds into this impossible to follow labyrinth of just uh, like he. To ha- he's keeping you in place because he wants to be on this case and this case is like not as important as and it's like mm. it's essentially just a system that feeds off itself and it's yeah that's kind of the irony of the plot of this film though don't you think is that because it's trying to mirror this really labyrinthine system that's in place but then the plot of the film actually does become quite convoluted and it does become quite hard to follow because of that which mm. i can imagine terry getting smiling that <laughs> having caused that effect but yeah. I, I definitely think we need to touch on Buttle. And yeah. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> because I mean, we were, oh, we were just talking about how like the the movie so comes convoluted and everything and, and a lot of kind of stuff. Buttle, 
is uh, arguably the most depressing aspect of the movie. Um, and yeah. it kind of kicks the whole thing off. And and I think they kind of dropped the ball of, of what, there's, what they intended to do with him or what they should be doing with him. Because obviously he gets killed because of a goof. Like a fly falls in the typewriter and it's like this like very yeah. dark gallows humor kind of thing. But then you get Sam delivering the check in this very upsetting scene. You know, like basically like the day after Christmas or something to his his wife, and uh, yeah. he seems completely unmoved <laughs> by this. Uh, he doesn't seem like pushed into action by the fact that the bureaucracy he works for killed this man. He's pushed into action because he loves this girl from his dreams. So he's almost like bothered that he's being assaulted with all this emotion, and then he's only ki- he's yeah. only kicked into action because the girl lives upstairs. <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, complete, that's quite a good point. You're completely right, and that's why I. That was my initial issue with it is that if there was going to be a motivating factor for him to rebel against the system, it should be that surely. And yeah, to be fair, there is some acknowledgement of that in the uh, in the dream sequence, in the later dream sequences. After that point, we do hear uh, that the Mrs. T- uh, Mrs. Buttle say. Uh, what have you done with his body? Uh, which is very haunting. It's really, really, oh, yeah, really that, creepy. It's really quite scary, yeah. actually. Um, but he doesn't. He doesn't seem to care about that at all, does he? That's more of an inconvenience, right? I, his 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 being haunted by her and the and the children, like in the black veils and everything, doesn't strike me as guilt. It strikes me as like he's he's being pestered by this. Uh, Almost like he's being mani- manipulated. Yeah, like it's another it's another thing he has to think yeah. about. Like it's bothering him, but. He doesn't, especially, I'm just going off that scene, really, because that's the main scene when he delivers the check of, like, he just seems avoidant. Like, he doesn't want to deal with what's happening. And, and, and like, this whole journey gets kicked off just because he notices the girl is upstairs. There's, and his line, uh, he says, you know, I didn't have to come down here. Right. It could be seen as a comment on that, um, this isn't my department type of thing like i don't have to deal with this he keeps bringing up how unusual it is that he'd come down doesn't he yeah like, it's, like, it's the only line of di- like the only line of defense that yeah. he really has but i think to try and disarm this grieving woman <laughs> to, to, to really sort of have a more justifiable plot for him to rebel against the system he he needs to have like an ounce of sympathy for her I think, and he really doesn't seem to. Right, like his his whole yeah. like yeah, I didn't have to come down here. It's an unusual thing. Like that works thematically with like the overall mood of the movie, but it doesn't work mm. with him as a protagonist, or at least as a protagonist no. I care about. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, I do agree with you. Yeah, there's there's so much of that though in the, in the film of them passing things on. Like we were talking earlier about when he signs the check, eventually comes back around is one of the things he's accused of at the end. So I think yeah. that, like, That's, oh yeah, I that, thought that was great. How he his entire list of crimes is read to him, and it's all these incremental things that we didn't even notice he does. And it's mm. like, oh my god, all the, they they have a record of everything. It's 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 <laughs> terrifying. Confess, or you'll mess up your credit rating. Yeah, that joke was so funny. <laughs> that, that that scene was really good. I thought actually, when it's his point of view in the straight jacket. Yeah. And all these faceless men are just listing his crimes back to him, and then it kind of, like the the score gets more intense until it's the ghouls from his dreams and the masks at the end. Uh, I thought that was it. Genuinely got me that bit. It scared me quite a lot. Just like on a design level, though, this film is honestly stunning. It's like it's like if Blade Runner, sorry, if Blade Runner was a comedy sort of thing. I was gonna say, <laughs> should we talk about the aesthetics of it? Because mm. it's. Yeah, I was, was going to say, like, the retro-futuristic thing that they were going for, where it was, like, analog stuff being transported rather than digital, definitely did remind me of Blade Runner. Particularly the design of his flat, I thought, was very much like... Um, I don't know how... These films must have been fairly close to coming out in terms of release date. Oh, I forget what year Blade Runner was. Blade Runner was, I believe, 1982. Yeah, 82, 81... Well, I think the I think like the the collection of analog technology that's supposed to be the future is actually really smart because it, it doesn't make um, like Blade Runner looks cool, whereas this world does not look cool. Everything just seems convoluted and and uh, you know it's not convenient. Like when 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 yeah. Sam wakes yeah. up, his like automatic coffee and toast maker just like destroys everything. <laughs> 
<laughs> straight out of Wallace and Gromit that scene. Right. So. You know, yeah. and everything's wires and buttons and it's just like it's just mass confusion all. It's like you're constantly being overwhelmed. Which is really the movie mm. itself. I mean, you talk about pacing. You know, for a two and a half hour movie, you know, this isn't Tarkovsky. This is like constant chase scene after chase scene after chase scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just it's it's anxiety inducing for the entire runtime. <laughs> it is. It, it's 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 breakneck, which is almost ironic when you consider how slow like all the inner workings of the system. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. I, yeah. The the um like Root Goldberg esque um interior workings of the of the apartment and stuff, but it just none of it none of it works. It's great. Um, I I watched in in the interview that I watched with, with Terry Gilliam, he was talking about how, uh, this was a this was on like Good Morning Britain in the like eighties when he was like promoting it and stuff. Um, he was saying how he wanted a collage effect of time, so it was um, so he based you know how everyone's sort of dressed in like the nineteen forties sort of bits everyone's a bit tweedy like mm. bowler hats and stuff like that yeah. Um, but then you've got like the bubble cars of the fifties and the uh, sort of retro futurism that came later, um, sort of post atomic age, and then uh, you've got like computers, computer technology, which is very seventies. So it was all, it was meant to sort of pastiche like the well, not meant to, but this is what he sort of had in mind was he wanted to make it very timeless in in a literal sense, in the sense that this could be going on at any point in the 20th century, yeah. be it 1999 or 1949. That, yeah, that really worked for me, I thought. it worked. Yeah, it massively worked for me. And um, I really like it when, when a film has a strong visual style, because uh, even when everything else falters, um, yeah. which I don't think it does in, for this film, but certainly some of the writing falters, um, you still have the aesthetics to hang on to. Um, and there are some... There are some quite remarkable shots, I thought. I mean, I thought the city, as horrible as it looked, was quite beautifully shot. Yeah, it's it's a really stunning-looking film. I, I, we keep saying it, but it really has to be hammered home to anyone who hasn't seen it, yeah. like just how good-looking this film is. There's so many really, really creative shots and sequences. I think of when he's going out to the Shangri-La building to tell Mrs. Tuttle about the check and all that. And there's that shot of him going through this miniature city and then you see the face peer over and it is actually a miniature city and a man right. <laughs> d- doing stuff to it and then you see what it really looks when it pulls back it's, it's so cleverly done and I guess that's down to I guess what also should be understated is that it's a really strong creative vision but the money is used really well to achieve it you, I don't know. I, I, Fourteen million doesn't actually sound like that much money to me to, for a film that looks like this. When you, when you consider films these days, mm. yeah, but inflation that would probably be like thirty million now, which I, I guess still is not that much yeah. for a for a visual. I mean, it's hard to say because you know, like I've seen so like in Blade Runner that the final apartment building where like the, the movie ends, like I've seen the miniature mm. of that building in person. And you know it's just like this tiny little wow. thing, yeah. But it's Flex. in a, yeah. I mean it's in a museum in the city, so I went I went to go see it. You know, but oh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's this tiny little thing. So like, budget wise, you're not like blowing up a backlot studio. Like you're you're no. you're blowing up toys. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess it's just a case uh, of that, finding the yeah. talent, isn't it? Then it, it puts things into perspective quite a lot when you put it like that. Because yeah, I mean, if someone making that miniature might just have like an hourly wage and it might take them like two weeks to make a really detailed like miniature of a city and stuff um which wouldn't come anywhere near the like two weeks wages versus like a full-blown like city set yeah that's relatively nothing i guess um so that but that's again that's why film is so great is because you can there are all these really awesome like creative little workarounds of stuff um i mean miniatures i think is such a shame that cgi has become as prevalent as it is not that i'm knocking cgi because you can do amazing things with it but it is a shame that we've sort of had to let go of that tradition do you know what i mean yeah. um, i mean we'll never get obviously blade runner 2049 was an incredible film visually 
but for very different reasons that the, the original Blade Runner was. And I feel like if this film was made today, it would it probably still be pretty visually arresting because Terry Gilliam is a very visual filmmaker, but it would definitely lose some of the charm that the original yeah, miniature I mean, had. Do you know what I mean? In fairness, 2049, that did use quite a lot of miniatures as well. Now it's my yeah. turn to flex because I've seen the miniatures for that <laughs> in New Zealand. <laughs> and uh, th- there, yeah, it's just like, it's just yeah. I guess it's just the creative mind behind the project knowing how to realize it. I, it's just I guess that's what a director does, but it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to get what's in your brain on a screen, I suppose, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, I always think about it, the first Alien when this kind of conversation comes up because if if Alien wasn't made in 1978 or whenever they shot it, and it was filmed now, it would be a very, very, very different movie. Mm-hmm. And it's like that movie that oh, that movie needs totally. all the, like the the man in the suit. You know, it needs the animatronics. Like, it needs all that stuff. Yeah. It would not work with CGI. I think I think Alien 3 is when they started using CGI for the dog alien, and that looked like crap. I mean, to get back to the whole miniature miniature discussion, it's um, Alien. I watched, that, I watched that the other week, and it's absolutely incredible. And, like, the LV-426, the big right. croissant right. Uh, <laughs> ship. Um I just it's just so great it just and and it, I, I, as you say like it had to be made at a time when mm-hmm. HR Giga was alive yeah. <laughs> and it had to be made at a time when everyone thought computers were going to were going to be we're just going to get bigger and chunkier one of the things that makes alien so great is yeah. that perfect aesthetic that blending of creepy lovecraftian freudian sexual imagery with um star trek esque retro futurism yeah, I mean, it, well, I mean, we could talk about miniatures all day, but uh, me and my dad were discussing Thunderbirds the other day, and I say to him like, I just, I just loved Thunderbirds so much when I was a kid. I just thought it was the sickest show ever, and I think it's cool because now. you could see that the the explosions were actually real. I think that went quite a long way into my like child psyche. Yeah, it's like, oh, this is cool because it's real, even though. They're fucking puppets, right. man. I, I, <laughs> but, I, I don't think some but, of like, go, yeah. the... Um, when you're a kid, it's cool. Some of the imagery and um, actual practical effects in Brazil would be anywhere near as unnerving or disturbing as they are if they weren't practical and there in the scene. I think they do a really good job of implementing those to kind of build this grimy, um, unnerving aesthetic that the film carries on throughout of it. And I think that is a big part of why it's kind of because I, I, when I said at the start about it being maybe not the best, but certainly like that two two and a bit hours that we watched it for went by so quickly, I think is because it is just so visually arresting. Kind of if if you are mm-hmm. at a loss for other parts of it, like you guys were saying, the plot, which wasn't so much of a thing for me, I was kind of enjoying the take on it. But even on that level, just watching it is a real, real treat. I need some information. Oh, Sam, this is information retrieval, not information dispersal. <laughs> Hey, Amy, don't throw the ball around in here. Oh, no, Amy, I'm Holly. Did I call you Amy, darling? I'm sorry. A triplet? One of them, I think. I'd like to I'd like to know what you guys thought about the social commentary. So, obviously, this film was made in 1985. Um, at a time when I think the whole um, health and safety civilization was finally coming, was, was starting to go on the rise. Uh, and, obviously in today's world in my opinion at least we're inundated with procedure like from the point that we take our first breath um do you think that this film has any relevance to audiences watching it now um i mean i think you're you're always going to have um i think the fear of a totalitarian government watching like, watching and managing every aspect of your life well, like we'll we'll call it like the fear of like communism taken to the nth degree uh, is always going to like you know mm. poke people. I think it's always going to be effective. I mean, if, I can't imagine it wasn't on everyone's mind in '85, you know, as the Soviet as the Soviet Union was winding oh, down. Yeah. But um, you know, mm. I, I don't know though if you can. I, I would say the pressing matter now, as far as like the well, we lazy and call it the Panopticon, uh, is social media at this point. And I think how you're always kind mm. of being watched. Um, you know, from that aspect, I don't know if you can really connect Brazil to to that right now. But I, I think the fear of the government is always going to be like almost like a timeless boogeyman. 
but yeah what i think one of the um yeah like i said the the one of the reasons that this one will should i think should connect with audiences today is the same reason why 1984 does like when i read that as a teenager it was like how was this written in the written in the 50s this feels like it's still so relevant today and i think if it's sharing a lot of the same uh cultural space as 1984 then it should stay as relevant in my view did anyone else think that this uh the actual mixing of the film in terms of like its audio channels oh my god it drove me though? nuts it drove me nuts oh was it i you guys uh, watching with um headphones was it really on? quiet i will for, i was watching with, i was watching with my girlfriend right. so i couldn't use headphones and okay. and if it was if i was alone yeah, i would have used headphones because I don't know what it is, but like the the music was like ear splitting. Uh, yes. And then like every fourth sound effect, you know, was like pierce my brain, but only like every fourth sound effect. And then the dialogue was just at the very bottom of the mix. Right at the bottom, wasn't it? It was terrible. It was so bad. I'm glad that I wasn't the only one that noticed. I thought it was something wrong with my TV. My my biggest takeaway when I saw it five years ago was oh my god this film is so loud at points it's hurting my brain when i saw it in the cinema i was like no i'm sure it's just that print i saw of it, it uh, surely a film can't be mixed that poorly and i saw it again today i was like no <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't crazy back then this is exactly how i remember it being yeah it's terrible audio terrible audio yeah and the, and the, there weren't any subtitles either we watched this on amazon and there was no well, option sub- subtitles no so like I couldn't, I was like, I had my fan on because it's <laughs> like 30 degrees in England right now. And I was like, oh, I'm going to have to turn the fan off and be really hot and sweaty for like the rest of the film. And, <laughs> I yeah, picture your I room was. looking like uh, Sam's room with all the pipes and like, <laughs> tubes and that. Are yeah, yeah. Like, I, had, I, I had to watch this film from my fridge. Yeah, I, I, had, <laughs> I had the air conditioner on. I had the air conditioner on. It was just too hot. I couldn't turn it off. So I just kept like, I was literally sitting there with the remote in my hand going up and going down with the dialogue, yeah. with the volume the entire time, because <laughs> like, I was surprised my neighbor didn't come like knocking on my door. Like, what do you, like, what did you lose your mind? Because like, it was just constant, <laughs> like these loud, loud noises. And then cranking yeah, it for man. the muffled dialogue. That's one of my biggest pet peeves in films is when they're not mixed well, because it, it drives me nuts having to constantly go to the volume control all the time. Yeah. I suppose that, uh, it, it's sort of some, uh, emblematic of the film. Itself, like, <laughs> really works properly. It's a feature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bonus feature. The, <laughs> the bonus features is you can actually hear what's going on. <laughs> Another one of the things I really, really liked in the film is that some of it, some of its like action felt really quaint in a way yeah. that felt very sort of sixties. T- uh, film that you'd see on television not that i w- was watching television in the 60s but that i don't know like a sort of sunday afternoon film you'd see oh in which, I, I, do you know what i mean like the jason the argonauts or something like that things like that where it, it was all quite low stakes action i thought I f- yeah like the biggest thing that happens in terms of set pieces he drive there's a car chase and okay there are there are they're being chased by these like big tank like uh cars which are, are basically miniatures when they you know when he, they go to the uh sort of uh waste plant wherever it is it um looks like an oil refinery and everyone's in hazmat suits they clearly just went to an actual one but it was <laughs> yeah that, like, that shot that's, I'd say that's probably that establishing lo- shot of it where i was like they've not done yeah. anything to and that. it just it just looks like a normal industrial <laughs> yeah. plant like that you'd see on the skyline um but in that setting, you not everything else is it's like so far away from the, the urban area. Uh, I, I guess it it, it kind of works. One of the ones I really wanted to see if it was a set or an actual location was where he gets tortured at the end inside that sort oh, of yeah. nuclear reactor uh, in the Thunderdome. Funnel. When I, yeah. I watched a um, yeah BFI interview, I think it's the same one that you referenced earlier, Jack, where he talked about that, and I yeah. think yeah, it was just one of those big. I'm not a camera what they're called now, but one of the big like they had a different plan for that room entirely, and that it was going to be like the corridors of the um, with like the white paneling and stuff. And then I think they were location right. scouting for that plant area, and he saw that space and was like, "Oh, that would be a great place for the um, the torture scene at the it's end." So striking. So I, I think it is uh, actually that bit at the end. We'll link to the interview. Who, 
Because I, I, I thought it might be, because I was like, I can't see where this could be a map painting. Like, it feels like it is the space that they're in. Like, either they've done a really good job of hiding yeah. it, like, tricking me, or <laughs> this is actually where it is. I was like, I really want to know where it was. It it was so, yeah, it was so amazing looking. It's kind of what um, yeah. they, uh, they, it seemed to me what they kind of based uh, the Cerebro room from the yeah, 2000s yeah. X-Men yeah. films on like to me. just like that. Even down to the... I was like, going to go uh, and track down yeah. the mutants. Yeah, yeah like the, 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 the thin walkway. <laughs> oh, the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah like everything. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It was mm-hmm. absolutely cerebral. Yeah. It's quite kind of, <laughs> so kind of, kind of funny. It's kind of funny that that of all things, that's what Brazil influenced. John <laughs> Price even had like that same kind of head bit on as well. Right. He, he did. It like he had cerebral. cerebral. Like <laughs> it's also it looks very cool, oh, but yeah. so unnecessary. Like uh, there, there, yeah. there is absolutely yeah. no yeah. reason yeah. why this this procedure would have to involve a nuclear reactor and this like long, scary walkway <laughs> with a platform in the middle. It's all yeah. for intimidation. It could literally be done in one room, right. like a small room. Um, but when uh, before I'd gotten to that scene, that I mean, they used that shot as like a promotional shot for the film because uh, it's so striking. So I, yeah, uh, I noticed when that. I, when, yeah, when I saw that, because I, I, I kind of figured out it was at the end because you hadn't it, seen it yet. Having, having, <laughs> yeah, but having read nineteen eighty four. It's like okay, that's obviously room one hundred and one, isn't it? Like basically, um, but it's they used it as a promotional shot, and uh, yeah, it's it's just like wow, that's horrible. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, so I guess it works as a promotional shot. You have to do these things. Some, like sometimes studios do that. Like they give away their most um, like incredible shots that would be really really effective at later points but they do it to sell tickets. Um, it's like when Harrison Ford, he was on the poster for every Blade Runner 2049 yeah. Uh, yeah. Shows promotional up like thing. Two and, a half and it's hours like, in. that's like a, tw- that's an actual twist <laughs> yeah. that they've given away there. I'd say the most famous <laughs> example is uh, the poster for Planet of the Apes was Charles Heston on his knees in front yes. of the Statue of Liberty, which is the yeah, last shot of the film. It's moment of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like... That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's ridiculous. But, yeah, it's... <laughs> I guess I guess they they put it in there for fans of the book. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad I brought that up because that people. that allows me to now insert the clip of Charles Heston screaming at the end of that film. <laughs> you blow it! You blow it! Finally, really did it! You maniacs! You blew it up! Oh, damn you! God damn you all the hell! Um, talking yeah. of endings, what did everyone think about the way that this movie kind of like faked out for a bit, or did did you see it coming? I saw it coming. Yeah. I uh, by by the time that he'd gotten out of mm-hmm. the building, uh, I was like, mm, nah, this like it was like. I can kind of, I can kind of believe it. If they all got completely wiped out as they were charging out, then I could have believed that. But the fact that everyone survived yeah. that it was, it yeah, was when they started just, going into like it, his dream sequences that I was like, oh, okay, this is part of his fantasy that we've seen throughout the film. So it's like it's not there. I didn't know whether they were going to explicitly state that or leave it open. I'm kind of glad that they did just make that statement. Yeah, because I, I think I, it, it would have I been. I think the yeah. studio cut was that it ends where his fantasy. Yeah. Well, it's not even a fantasy. I think that is just which the would have been completely against the spirit of this film. Right. Yes. Exactly. No. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> again, like we, I think when we talked the other day, like, we talked about how the ending of Blade Runner has been edited three times too. Like you know, it's like yeah. it really changes yeah. the meaning. Like yeah. I, I, so I forgot how this movie like was gonna was gonna go. I just forgot because it's been over half a you know decade. And That's I right didn't up. realize where it was going. Like I could have bought that they won the shootout. I knew where it was going as soon as Robert De Niro disappeared yeah. in the newspapers or in yeah. the the mm-hmm. bureaucratic forms, rather. Yeah. Like as soon as he vanished in the paper, I was like, oh, okay, yeah. no, he didn't make it out. <laughs> like you know. I, I thought, yeah, no, yeah, obviously, obviously not. I thought that was yeah. an incredible visual, though. Like more than more than most things, that actually creeped me out. That that it it was really creepy. Just how. Um. It's it's like that first bit where that that piece of paper lands on his ankle and it, he can't move it and it's like, oh what what and then he just gets covered by more and more and it's 
I really it's love horrible. that bit. Mm. It reminds really me of some of my dreams I've had where I'm just trying to move and I'm, it's like I'm trying to walk through sludge. It made me mm. feel very odd, that, that scene. It's really well done. I did I did enjoy the shootout. There's a little bit of a, to bring it back to your point, Anthony, mm. a bit of a power fantasy. Because uh, it's just like, it's just like that standard, oh, fuck the system, we're going to bring it all down, like uh, blowing up the huge bureaucratic building. Like It was satisfying, but then obviously a bit undercut by the ending, which is obviously intentional, and I'm glad that they did it. But then at the same time, you kind of sympathize. You kind of you you you're a bit like, oh, fair play, Sam. You've just completely escaped inside your own head. Like they can't really hurt. Right, you. Which is all he, which is all he's ever yeah. wanted to do the whole movie. I mean, he, I I I yeah. was I was kind of like making fun of it while I was watching it. I was like, this guy keeps falling asleep. Like, like I like, guess he narcoleptic. <laughs> like he just keeps like going out and going to these dream sequences. But like, but it, it's yeah. also. The, the shootout too, though, doesn't really make sense because there's no hint that that Tuttle is is a revolutionary at all. He's just like a freelance repairman. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And the the terrorists, if there are any terrorists, never make right. any demands. There's never a head a head of a terrorist organization. I think um, you could argue that Tuttle's not even real. Like, no one yeah. else ever acknowledged. Actually, His no, sequences Jill are Jill does, like, doesn't she? When he, yeah, yeah. Except for that, at one point, I was convinced that he was Tuttle because um, he essentially gets blamed for all the crimes that yeah. Tuttle commits. Yeah, because um, he the like Bob Hoskins. We haven't mentioned Bob Hoskins. Oh, yeah, of course. He's yes. in this, but Bob Hoskins is the heating repair guy. He blames him for fixing. The, the mm. heater by himself, um, and that's one of the one of one of his one of his crimes that he gets accused of at the end. Um, so that's what yeah. made me think that he invented this uh, other persona that he could pursue his sort of more exotic fantasies. Through. I also love the way that um, De Niro like enters and exits the scenes. I got a good laugh every time he ziplined away into the city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this impossibly yeah, big yeah. building, just like it's so <laughs> steep as well. The, the zipline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's very clear. Even yeah, that like, bit was quite like, like superhero esque. It was like the way that Batman it was like an like, action man yeah. set, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was, I love that. That's like the quaintness that sort of make makes you like makes you think, ah, oh, this is actually quite. Even though it's really horrible and oppressive, it's actually quite a nice film. Sometimes it, it's got those like those brief reprieves of being quite sort of um, calming. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, every because even though everything's like quite horrible and like the world's gone to shit and every the bureaucratic process taking over everything, it's it's got that like weird like British small town vibe. Mm. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Where it's like every, it, uh, even though it's all a bit repressed and rubbish and grey all the time, everyone sort of is happy with yeah. their lot in life. And that's the thing that like even though. I agree. There's lots of comparisons that could be made to 1984, and it does take a lot from the narrative. That's the part that makes it different enough for me, in that I can like separate the two. Or even though, because I was thinking when I was watching it of those comparisons as well, but it, it puts its own spin on it. I think, and kind of justifies its interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> you don't exist anymore. I've killed you. Jill Layton is dead. Care for a little necrophilia? Hmm? Should we wrap up our thoughts? Give it a little rating if you fancy. Oh, I'll, I'll kick us off. Uh, flippin' loved it. I, I laughed so much this time. There's still so much I want to talk about, even. We didn't even touch on the whole Christmas angle, which I really want to talk about. Uh, and also, we didn't touch on his mother at all. Just that entire no. character on the whole plastic surgery stuff, which I love. That just goes to show how much there is in this film. Exactly. Like, too it's... much covering a one-hour discussion. Yeah, it's, that's the thing. It's a two-and-a-half-hour film, and i kind of forgotten that. When I, when I recommended it, either Jack or Jamie, you said to me, like, Oh, that's quite long, isn't it? It's two and a half hours. I'd completely forgotten that that's how long it is because it does actually fly by. And like I said at the beginning, for a film that 
the plot doesn't hold me the whole film. It's really impressive that it can hold my the film in it, as an entirety could hold my attention for that long, and I wish it was longer even. So yeah, I'll probably give it like an eight, eight out of ten. I, it's really good. Um, yeah, I really liked it. Um, I I agree that it's flawed, um, but it sort of manages to circumvent those obvious flaws by all the really, really good stuff that it did. And it's just such a wonderfully unique film. And it's so, it, a lot of it, a lot of it works. I'd say like 80% of it works really well. And 20% of it kind of like, is a bit all fart, no poo. <laughs> um, I think that happens. Uh, <laughs> so I'd probably give it I'd probably give it a seven. I'd give it a seven. Um the the right the writing, the narrative stuff, uh the slightly underwritten protagonist does falter it. It does hamper it some somewhat, but the 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 seven points that I give it are like very well earned, I think. I felt like I've I've been kind of critical of this thing through the whole time. And that's just because I feel like I wanted to like it more than I did. Um, because I, I loved looking at it. I mean, it's such a, it's, it's an amazing visual movie. Um, but, uh, yeah, the narrative kind of brings it down for me. Um, I would say like a solid uh, seven out of 10 is where I would land. If it, if it tightened up the story a bit, it would be a a classic. I mean, it is a classic, but I would, I'd say it's like a flawed masterpiece. I, th- I was actually really taken by its charm in its own dark, kind of disturbing way. And, um, yeah, visually, like we've all said, it was incredible. I love the humour. I think sort of the touchstones with and my love for Python kind of helped that a bit. But I think this certainly carved its own path as well at the same time um, of being a link to those two things. And, yeah, I just thought, like, the humour... Um, visually and like some of the themes as well just really works and in a, in a way that you kind of wouldn't expect from combining those different elements so yeah i think for me it might be might be a nine i think i'll go for a nine Whoa. wow so i wow, really very, yeah, really really very enjoy high it. praise yeah yeah well uh, this is a i feel like this is a very good a very good discussion there's still so many yeah. more there's still so <laughs> many really more it. Yeah, chat it about is. but I'm just wary of maybe, bashing my head maybe we'll do wall. a part two in the future yeah <laughs> it would be fun to do a Gilliam yeah. film again because it, yeah. you're, you're yeah. never at loss of things to chat about I actually held work. back on I really wanted to watch 12 Monkeys today because I just wanted more of like his stuff yeah. to be in his mind a little bit more so I'm going to watch it this weekend I think if you haven't watched Time yes. Bandits watch Time, Time Bandits, Bandits is the one I want to see next I'm desperate Time... to see that it is great it's great it's really weird my brother's yeah. always said watch it you'll love it now I'm, I have the I'm urge sure to before, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely going to yeah. watch more of this stuff it's... after this I was yeah really really taken by it yeah he's an infectious mm-hmm. filmmaker I think yeah Thank you, uh, Anthony, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much, Anthony. Hanging out with you was was cool. Yeah, our first (laughs) guest was a rip roaring. It's gonna be your highest ratings. It's gonna be your highest ratings. Yeah, you just watch. Yeah, no, you're you were um, actually. We'd rather have you back. (laughs) (laughs) But Jack. A very big thanks to Anthony for being with us on the pod this week. It was a good one, I thought. And don't worry, Olivia stands out there. She's not being replaced. Be sure to check out the Cavity Mag site where you can find Anthony's writing or more directly to his Twitter where you can catch it straight from the horse's mouth. Back again next time. So long. <laughs>